Good morning. I'm Ned Damon, uh, Principal Data Scientist here at DAT, and I'm joined by uh, Dr. Chris Kaplis, our Chief Scientist. Hi, everybody. Doing, good morning. How are you doing, Ned? Yeah, I'm doing good. You know, the weather, it was, it was very nice yesterday. I went camping this weekend, and we got one day of not raining. So, you know, in yep. Oregon, in uh, November, that's an achievement. That's pretty great. Here in uh, New England, in Boston, it's gorgeous today. Nice, bright, crisp fall weather. I love fall. Favorite season. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, definitely in my top 10 seasons. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad to be here, Ned. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, so today it's just Chris and I. Um, Dean and Ken are off uh, gallivanting around the greater wilds of the Mountain West. Um, mm -hmm. for important DAT stuff, and not that this isn't important, but uh, we're, we're left behind to tend the, tend the homestead. And with that, we're going to be going into our key points of the week, but uh, while I am transitioning, I would want to remind everyone to please get your questions in. I see we've already gotten one question in, which is excellent, but um, if you want questions answered, please send them in to us and we'll take care of them. Anyway, key trends we're watching. Uh, number one, spot rates are leveling off at record high levels. Um, looks like for, uh, there's not too much climb left. We'll get into more of that when we get to the forecast, but there's still a little bit of headroom in the spot rates and that's been pretty, uh, pretty high up there. Contract rates are also cooling. Um, they're down two cents a mile over the last four weeks. Not a lot of movement, but any downward movement in this kind of market is appreciated for people who are sensitive to high rates. Um, in terms of volume, spot market volumes of overall in our data set doubled since pre-pandemic years. We're up 24% year to date. Um, sorry, we are at 24% spot versus contract year to date. Um, more typically, we have about a 14% to 86% spot contract split. Uh, on the port news, which we'll be getting to in more detail later, uh, the West Coast port congestion has set a new record, 83 vessels at anchor, waiting 16.9 days on average to unload. So I uh, hope you got your Christmas uh, presents ordered early. And finally, it is uh, time for truckers to prepare for the winter. Uh, don't miss this week's market update, which you will find at dat.com forward slash market update to find all kinds of useful driver tips to make sure that you're getting uh, the fuel efficiency and safety that you need uh, moving into the winter season. With that, we're heading over to Dr. Kaplis to go through our market dynamics. Chris, take it away. All right. Thanks, Ned. I'm going to be channeling my inner Dean Croak without the Australian accent. So I have his notes and so I'll try to do justice to what Dean does. So let's start with dry van with the load to truck ratio. Um, so dry van, and you're going to see a common theme here with all three modes. Dry van load post volumes dropped last week. They're now about 9% month over month down following last week's 7% increase or decrease rather. Aquarium post surged, uh, increasing by 14% week over week, resulting in last week's load to truck ratio dropping from five to four. And so that's, that's a big trend. We're seeing this also in temp control. Following the prior week's surge in demand for reefer equipment, load post volumes dropped by 7% week over week, but remain 2% up month over month. And equipment posts increased to their highest level ever, ever this year, up 17% week over week, pushing last week's uh, reefer load, truck to, um, load to truck ratio down 21% from 13.5 to 10.7. Finally, on flatbed, for load to truck ratio again load post volumes dropped for the third week in a row and are now down 15 percent month over month following last week's 11 percent week over week decrease and like the other two modes equipment post increased by 12 percent resulting in the flatbed load to truck ratio decreasing from 41 to 33. so you see some common trends there with the dropping of the uh, load posts and equipment posts surging across all three which is kind of interesting seeing whether are we peaking now or not Okay, let's turn over to market conditions index. Uh, let's start with van. And so repeating what Ned said, uh, port congestion is still front news. It's uh, something you'll all discuss over Thanksgiving dinner because everyone knows about the number of uh, ships waiting off of Long Beach. New record on Friday, 83 containers. That's equivalent to about 589,000 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent unit containers, with all of your Christmas and probably some of your Halloween goods still on there, waiting an average of almost 17 days. Uh, along the entire West Coast, capacity remains tight. Spot rates up about a nickel a mile this week, up to an average of about 230 mile, excluding fuel surcharge, of course. And specifically, if we look at the LA and Ontario markets, spot rates were up at another three cents a mile and about 349 a mile uh, with uh, fuel surcharge excluded, of course. So this is up almost 13 cents a mile in the last four weeks. 
Loads east to Atlanta from Ontario, hit a new 12-month high at 316 a mile, again, excluding fuel surcharge. And while loads uh, to the expanding warehouse market in Phoenix did the same, averaging about 461 a mile for the 336-mile haul, that re represents an increase of about $1.60 a mile since February, when the port congestion and import volumes really started to surge. Finally, on the East Coast, capacity was tight in Richmond, Virginia, where the load post volumes were up 8% week over week, pushing up spot rates by an average of $0.09 cents a mile to an average of two ninety four dollars a mile, again, excluding fuel surcharge. Moving over to temp control. Um, this is, uh, you know, the intersection of fall produce and Christmas tree season is keeping reefer capacity tight, especially in the Pacific Northwest. For example, in Twin Falls, Idaho, reefer spot rates were up $0.27 cents a mile last week, to an outbound average of about 261 a mile, again, excluding fuel surcharge. In fact, capacity was tight throughout the entire Pacific Northwest region, including Pendleton, Spokane, Medford, Portland, and Seattle freight markets, where spot rates were up 9 cents a mile to an average of about 316 a mile last week. Spot rates from Seattle to Stockton and LA are up about 85 cents a mile year over year to 239 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge this week. And loads from Seattle to Dallas hit a 12 month high of about $3.18 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge, which is just over a buck a mile higher compared to the same time last year. And then finally, turning to flatbed for market conditions, uh, let's move to Florida. Uh, not literally, of course. The state of Florida found flatbeds in high demand last week. Spot rates jumped 12 cents a mile on average to 258 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge. And capacity was tightest in Miami, where outbound load post volumes jumped 32% week over week while inbound volumes only increased by 3% week over week. And this created a huge capacity imbalance for both brokers and shippers. In Miami, spot rates were up about 9 cents a mile last week to an average of 239 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge, while loads west on the 864 mile haul to New Orleans jumped to $1.91 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge. This was up 52 cents a mile year over year and 23 cents a mile above the average for October. Further west in Houston, load post volumes remained flat this week, but like most large flatbed markets, capacity was really tight, pushing up spot rates by three cents a mile to an average of 281 a mile, again, excluding fuel surcharge. Finally, last uh, group is uh, spot rates. Let's start with dry van. So after increasing substantially the week prior, the national dry van average spot rates remained flat last week, around 254 a mile excluding fuel surcharge. Spot rates are now about 11% or 29 cents a mile higher than they were this time last year. Reefer spot rate ended last week where it started at the national average of 296 a mile, excluding fuel surcharge, which is about 17% or 51 cents a mile higher than the same time last year. Finally, with flatbed, it capacity cooled off last week following a 4% a mile drop in spot rates to a national average of 255 a mile, 255 a mile again, excluding fuel surcharge. Compared to the same week last year, flatbed spot rates are still 13% or 33 cents a mile higher and 42 cents a mile higher than 2018. So that's it for this week's market update. And if you want to find out more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com slash market update and download our weekly report. And with that, it's back to you, Ned, for the short term forecast. Hello, everybody. We're going to be starting with dry van. In blue, you can see the market rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you can see our forecast models. Right now in dry van, there's pretty broad model agreement between our rate cast model in green and our short term model in red over the next couple of weeks with rates uh, expected to head upwards by about five to seven cents. But then once we get into the Thanksgiving season, the short term model is expecting that trend to continue going forward, while the rate cast model is expecting uh, rates to kind of break a little bit and head back down by a couple of cents as we move into December. Uh, in gold and silver, we have the blended forecast, which are mixtures of those two forecasts in different amounts and in different ways. And here, um, they are leaning a little bit more towards the rate cast model in this particular case. I would expect that uh, the rate cast model has a better grasp on what's going on, given that this is a very strongly seasonal period of time, and the short term model isn't as strongly weighed down by seasonality. Uh, moving forward to reefer. Once again, you can see in blue the market rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you can see our forecast models. Uh, again, here we have pretty good model agreement 
moving through the next couple of weeks with the short term and rate cast model, both expecting rates to go up by about five cents. But once again, similar story to what we saw in Van, where the two uh, diverge after we get through the Thanksgiving season with rate cast in green, expecting most of that van that sorry, that reefer rate to be given back to the tune of about 10 cents. Uh, moving into the holidays before peaking up just a little bit as we move into the middle part of December. In contrast, the short-term model is expecting things to continue up and to the right, and the blended forecasts are leaning towards the short-term model in this particular case. Once again, I feel that rate cast is the model to use in this circumstance, given that uh, we are in a period that is so strongly affected by seasonality, where we have these really big troughs and, and peaks as we move through the holiday season. Finally, moving to flatbed, you can see in blue the market rates observed by DAT. And then what we have very strong model divergence here uh, in our forecast. In green, the rate cast models expecting things to level off and then maybe pick up a bit as we head into the Christmas season, whereas the short term model is expecting things to be basically just straight down into the right, dropping by about 10 cents over the next month. Um, the blended forecasts in gold and silver are leaning more towards the short term model. Here, there's been a, an overall sustained downward trend, but I think that the level of sly that's shown in the short-term model is a little bit extreme, and I would lean more towards the blended forecast or rate cast in this particular circumstance. And with that, we are done with our uh, short-term forecast, and it's time to get on to our DAT IQ question of the week, which is, given that we have Dr. Chris Kaplis on, um, what's your take on the overall congestion in the freight market? It's a, it's been crazy times. I mean, we thought yeah. this uh, the peak would end like three different times, like in the Q, end of Q1 2021, and then the Texas freeze happened, and it seems like uh, that pushed things into spring and early summer, and then August never happened. The things were peaking then. I think uh, I think things are going to stay congested throughout the rest of this year. Um, there's just so many supply and demand issues going on. We're still buying a lot of stuff. We still have a lot of money, and with all the money. That it's come, uh, people are not getting back to work. The, the participation rate is still low. So that means the uh, you know supply of product is still struggling a little bit. I think it'll eventually break in 22. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's my sense. I don't know, what do you think, Ned? You look at the numbers a lot more than I do. Um, I mean, I was with you where I was really expecting 21 to be the point at which we kind of went back to a new, uh, a normal-ish kind of circumstance. Yeah. I do think that 22, like I think we were talking earlier, Q2 22 is probably if I was going to put my money anywhere, but it wouldn't be a lot of money. And then there's something else that I think is important to address, which is even though things are going to go back more the way they were, where we weren't going to have so much congestion and so much sensitivity to small disruptions in the freight market, things aren't going to go back to exactly where they were before. There's been a lot of wage increases. There's been like inflation isn't, there's, there's not going to be a deflationary period. Don't expect rates to go back exactly where they were, you know, two years ago, before, more than, well, I guess two years ago now, uh, yeah, before yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. You know, there's, there's going to be, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It, what's interesting is there's, um, you know, everyone's facing shortages right now. And so when mm -hmm. anyone faces a shortage, you're, everyone's gut reaction, whether you're a company or a housewife or a, a, someone ordering for a, a family, um, you're going to over order because yeah. you want to have enough to be sure. And so for businesses, this means you put in multiple orders to multiple vendors, maybe for a little bit more, just in case you know you're going to be allocated, but you're going to get something. And so I think what's going to happen here is we're going to have a uh, we're setting ourselves up for a bull whip, which in yeah. other words, people have so much extra orders in and if demands even if it just settles down doesn't continue to grow there's going to be a glut of inventory and let me give you an example think of all if anyone's trying to buy a car or a truck right now it's hard right because of the chips those chips right. are going to come in and they're going to come in right when the 22 models and maybe even later models are starting to be introduced as well so we're going to have a glut in 22 of trucks it's going to happen because all the chips are going to come in they're not going to suddenly just sell the old ones they're going to go to the new models as well so I think this will reflect in a lot of different industries where we're going to see um, a lot of different uh, excess inventory coming in, maybe end of Q1, Q2. That's that's my my guess. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look back to like 2018, 2019, there was that big glut of trucks. The rates had been doing really well for so long. Uh, there was an overproduction of capacity. And then that, I mean, it is to a certain extent like a self uh, self-correcting market. Uh, to the extent that it can. And it's really just sort of limitations on supply that are preventing that kind of first derivative thermostatic uh, correction 
to, from occurring. First derivative thermostatic. We have too many PhDs <laughs> on here. Oh my, I'm gonna get my blackboard out and start writing things. Um, but, but Ned, do you think it's gonna be a, re a freight recession like 2019? I don't think it's gonna be, I, I was asked I, yesterday about this and I think it's gonna, it's gonna re regress to the mean to the average three to 4% growth rate that we see in contract rates year over year. Um, yeah. I don't think we're going to see a sudden grounding. I, I don't think it's going to be a sudden grounding because I don't think that there's that same circumstance where we had such an overproduction of trucks because the trucks have been trickling in so slowly. Um, but I do think that there is going to be an overcorrection. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's just way too much pent up people. You know, as somebody who builds forecasts, it's really easy to build a forecast off of what's been happening in the last three, six, nine months. And we've been going on in this way for a year. And so people's expectations are going to need to get reset. And one of the ways that that tends to happen is through um, a non-trivial price drop. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, we all suffer from recency bias. Yeah. Right? We think what's happening right now is going to continue. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. like the talking head, same as it ever was, same as it ever yeah. was. Yeah. Right. But it's not. And so we have to. That's why it's hard to forecast now, because yeah. you almost have to ignore this pandemic time because it's so abnormal. And um, I was asked the other day, you know, because total volume did not go up that much, but it's mm -hmm. all in different places. And people who are not in transportation have a really hard time understanding why that matters. If the same number of truckloads are happening. Um, why does it matter that it's that retails up and some industries are down? Why does it matter that there are more origin or des location destinations? And that matters tremendously in truckload because it's all economies of scope. And if you're yeah. not balanced, uh, that causes all the problems. Yeah. No, I mean, people people's ability, the, the whole market is built off of people being able to expect where they're going to get their next truckload mm -hmm. from, where they're going to get their next move yeah. from. And if it's not in the place that they expect or if it, they expect it now that they're going to have to deadhead a lot, that's just reflected in slow, yeah. lower overall capacity, lower overall utilization, and it's it's a rough scene. But Ned, what's your thoughts about the the growing number of carrier authorizations that have happened this year? I think is the number like eighty thousand, where the, the, the lease drivers have moved yeah. over and owner operators have started their own own gigs. That is what we've been seeing. It's hard to kind of disambiguate that from new entrants, but. From everything that we've been able to tell, it's not been a huge glut of new entrants. It's mostly been people moving from larger organizations yeah. to smaller ones and hanging out their own shingle. Uh, one thing that is kind of good about that, we had done some research previously, um, a person on our team who's no longer with us, uh, Dr. Cynthia O'Rourke, she had done an analysis of survival rates for these like new entrants. Huh. And we were really worried that there was going to be um, that sort of when the big guys caught a cold, they would catch pneumonia. But what we found is that there isn't like a really big differentiation in new entrant survival, people who come in during really? the good times versus people who come in during a more normal time. It's not that people are coming in and they're only able to function in these kind of periods of high rates, but um, that does involve being smart. You know, that that was what has happened historically. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when we go forward, whether these firms yeah, are able to, to survive. Smaller firms tend to do poorly when the fuel goes up, right? Because yeah. the fuel surcharge programs, usually it's paid, what, 30, 60 days after. And so they have cash flow <laughs> problems. You can There's a real tight correlation between fuel prices and bankruptcies for the small yeah. guys. But what's also really interesting, I think we'd agree it didn't really add much total volume capacity to no. the market. But no. it created this, uh, the tail got longer, mm -hmm. right? That long tail of small guys, which means that shippers now probably have to rely on brokers more. Because yes. shippers don't like to deal with individual owner operators. It's too much to manage. That's where brokers yeah. really come in and serve a, a, a strong role. So I wonder if this uh, strengthened the role between shippers and brokers. What do you think? I, I think it probably did. I think it also, in the broker space, I mean, brokers have their preferred sh uh, carriers that they like to work with. And I think that for a lot of them, they're having to work on these new carrier relationships. And there's just frictions of transaction when you're onboarding a new carrier. I mean... Uh, you see this behavior a little bit in the load board, but how often do uh, you get a call or you hear from a carrier uh, and there's somebody new and you might not necessarily want to just jump on their their offer right. and you'll keep searching to see if you can find somebody that you're more familiar with. Right, right. No, that makes sense. Yeah. No, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on this year. It's a, it's a like I said, over Thanksgiving dinner, even grandma knows what a supply chain is now. And you can oh, have boy. a, you, tell, you don't have to talk politics. You can talk trucking. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yeah no thanksgiving uh, that'll be 
That'll be really interesting. I think at this point, uh, we're going to pivot to some of our listener questions. Uh, as gotcha. a reminder, if you want your listener questions to be answered, please uh, contact us uh, via comments or um, I forget what it is, what they're called on LinkedIn, Florps. I don't know. Just just guessing. Uh, anyway, put your comments in the chat and they'll get conveyed to us and we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, from Lazar Jovanovic. Hello, guys. Even though you might answer this on the data presentation, what are your expectations regarding California van exit loads during the holidays? What would be the less, best lanes going out? Uh, Chris, I think you talked about that a little bit from Dean's notes, but um, yeah, yeah, we'd need, we're the, the more data end of, of yeah, the that's that's, a, that's Dean a Dean question. question. Yeah. Dean question for that. For the best specific lanes, I mean, right now, yeah. anything out is pretty good, right? Yeah. Because things are, there's so much demand coming out. The, the challenge is getting in uh, mm -hmm. to it, right? That's where they're, the big parking lots getting into the docks and all the big snarled traffic. Um, yeah. But getting out and post holidays, say so the question is, how long will this sustain? Yeah, there are 83 ships out there, or there were on Friday. So the question is, how long will that go? It's November now. Is that going to continue through Q4 or is that going to start winnowing down? Will they start churning I, through that? I don't know. Dean, Dean had a number uh, that he quoted last show that was the like throughput of mm -hmm. ships per day. I forget exactly what it was, but I mean, I think that if I knew the number, I'd be able to give a more <laughs> specific comment, but I don't remember it off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, it's one big queuing model, right? Right. You know it's a queuing model. You, to, you need to get the data for the arrival rates, the processing time, and the thing with, and we all know, everyone on this call knows a port isn't just a port, right? right. They unload it. And so what everything the, the uh, Port of LA reports is it, unloading is when they unload it and s stick it on the dock. It's got to go into the yard. It's got to be picked up from the yard. The drage has to come in. It has to move out of the port to an interport and find a chassis before any of that. And so there's so many steps that don't get reported. It's not like unload and suddenly it's on a train um, mm -hmm. a lot of steps and that's where the problems lie so i got no good answer for you lazar sorry sorry uh Irakli, uh how can one communicate with you is there a phone number we could call and then he repeats uh, dr capitalist i was reading one of your reports and capstone projects from your students at mit can we communicate with you by email or phone email is great um yeah. if on the dat side um that is the the ned Ken Dean side of the house, you can email us at askiq at dat.com. That's yep. askiq at dat.com. Uh, Chris, um, I'm not sure if you want to give your, your email sure. right in public. My last, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> capitalist, my last name at mit.edu. Just Google capitalist MIT, I'll pop up. Yeah. We, we love to get questions from people. We'll answer Absolutely. them as best we can. Absolutely. Uh, Trey Henley, the company I work for mostly moves consumer freight. One concern that was brought to my attention was the length of our peak season. Do you think the port situation is going to extend peak season once we start getting more of the containers moved out to the consumer DCs? Um, I imagine that the tail is going to get longer. Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. I think it'll usually peak season ends what? Right after Black Friday? Kind of in um, early there's a little bit. There's a little bit into the, the early part of the, uh, December. So, you know... I, I know over the years, I have a bunch of friends and colleagues who work at Amazon, and the, the peak shipping day is keep moving. It's moving closer and closer to Christmas. So, and I think with this long tail from the uh, from the ports, I think it's going to push through later yeah. than normal. I, I, I agree with that. I would be surprised if it last past, lasted past, say, the 20th of December. But, I yeah. mean... You know, it's what's yeah. the interesting thing. So, you know, Walmart just came out today and said they they their stock they got tons of inventory and all the stuff. Um, but uh, we'll see if if someone's short. But maybe the best thing to do for personal advice is to get gift certificates because mm. the stuff's going to come in. It might right. come in in January, and you probably have better deals again because there will be a glut when you get things slowed down. So maybe the best thing to do is give gift certificates and be prepared to go shopping in January. Uh huh. Yeah. Kyle Harrington, with Uber's, uh, pardon, with Uber's acquisition of Transplace, are there any implications for the broader 3PL industry? How do they remain competitive? Oof. I feel like that's kind of a Ken question. I can I can talk about that. I was if just at Uber Freight. Yeah, I was just at Uber Freight's opening of the new post office in, in Chicago. If anyone's been to Chicago, seen the post office building, they have a floor there, um, which is pretty amazing. So, um, and then uh, both Frank McQuigan and Leo Aran, the, the CEOs of both uh, Uber Freight and of uh, Transplace talked. And so, I mean, they're, they're doing a really interesting play, right? And they're essentially doing managed transportation and procurement, which is Transplace is known for and has blue chip customers. 
And Uber Freight is really on the smaller side. They, they deal with some of the smaller carriers and they have a really strong uh, brokerage. They don't call it a brokerage, but it's a brokerage. And so the marriage of those two, I think, will be pretty, pretty strong. They, they complement each other. They don't really overlap each other. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if C.H. Robinson and Transplace, you know, merge, that would be a lot of overlap. But here, I, I didn't see any for that. So I think they will complement. Although right now, there's probably going to be a, a partition between the two. They'll operate separately. But I know the data scientists in both organizations, and they're solid. They're really good. And so I expect um, good things from them. Do you think that the the Uber Freight kind of digital brokerage model is going to be moving higher up the value chain, moving into to bigger bigger carriers and bigger partners? Yeah, I think carriers, yes, I think so. I think the real change that I've seen over the last year, two years, is that uh, the dynamic side of the freight business, as opposed to dedicated or contract, the mm -hmm. dynamic where you go straight to um, one of those sophisticated brokers mm -hmm. is increasing dramatically. And so if you can have an API out and you get a, a, an instant quote back that you are within your guidelines, if you look at, uh, you know, use DAT as a benchmark and say within a certain window, it's it works. It just makes yeah. sense for a large chunk of lanes, which are the kind of the trouble lanes, the, the sparse volume lanes. I think that makes a ton of sense. And Uber Freight and uh, has really been pushing that. Uh, development. I had Bill Driegert on my podcast, Freight Find podcast. I'm plugging myself here, Ned. No, uh, which comes out every other Thursday. And so I had him on, and we talked about that. Uh, that whether it used to be, you do the a shipper would do a sophisticated procurement exercise. So all the all the emphasis and brains was on the planning, and then execution was like a wood chipper, you know, throw it through the routing guide. Yeah. And now we're seeing more brains on the execution side, and so we talk about that. And what, what what makes sense? And will it keep going? Will the RFPs keep going? So it's been pretty interesting to see how that's been evolving over the last couple of years. Yeah, no, the execution side is really interesting because, I mean, looking at the, at the rates data, there's just so much heterogeneity. Uh, there's so much difference between what you're able to get for essentially the same load. Like it looks to me, from my perspective, yeah, yeah. like it's the same load, but you get like 20 cents a mile of difference. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it's having to do with being able to, to, get the right carrier and and get the right price and being able yeah. to price well you you let your inner phd come sorry, out with sorry, sorry. i'm trying i'm trying <laughs> <laughs> yeah no we see this we call it the blood chart so i was i just yeah. in a presentation where i show on a, on a lane that has like 20 shippers on it what the average is and then i break it up by load by week and then by by individual shipper with colors mm -hmm. and it's just dramatic you can yeah. see the routing guide compliance for some and others are all over the place um, but you're right. It can be a 20, 30 cents a mile difference between shippers yeah. and you don't know why. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the shippers know why. And and they, there's all these like little ticky tacky. This had this specific kind of a circumstance, but you can't handle it in just like this broad commoditized way that would make me happy and make my life easier. Yeah. But but yeah. Ned, that's why you're developing a much more sophisticated rating model similar and beyond yeah. what we do at FMIC, where we look at the drivers. We can we can. Yeah tell why some of the things are different, mm -hmm. right? Different service level, things like that, drive, uh, whether yeah. it's a live unload, drop and hook. And you, what you're developing now that's in the works that we can't talk about apparently uh, is yeah. much more sophisticated. <laughs> so it's getting there to be able to explain those differences between shippers. Yeah, no, that that's what we're shooting for. Uh, yeah. Right now we're doing okay, but it's not, not quite ready for prime time yet. That's okay. All right, uh, let's see if we can get some more of these questions. Brian Warren, uh, I was thinking about starting a box truck business. Do you think the economy will hold up the next couple of years? A couple of years is a long time. Um, box trucks, uh, Sprinter vans, that segment of the market has definitely been a growing fraction of overall moves. Um, I'm a little ner nervous is maybe the wrong term, but a little bit... It, cautious about what I would expect in the next couple of years for box trucks. What, what's your take on that, Chris? I mean, it's e-commerce isn't going away, home delivery. So you're delivering to more points of final consumption. So the demand for box trucks, I think, will go up. The question yeah. is, are you late to the party? Because right. a lot of this volume is, you know, you what are you competing with now? Um, mm -hmm. You could you would either get a franchise with Amazon or you're competing with uh, UPS or some of the local guys. So um, was it labor? Um, uh, what is it? Lightsaber? What, what's the name of another local one? It's a tough oh, business, yeah. but uh, there's a lot of business out there, but you might be a little late to the party. Yeah. I mean, might you send. that said, if you can have good uh, brokers, good shippers that you work with, you can make sure that you have a steady stream of freight. Uh, that is something that you can worry. It's really about making sure that you've got the source of, of the freight to move and not necessarily about the yeah. underlying model. Yeah. It's 
because it's yeah. a local market. It, it's right. a local thing. You don't have there don't that I know of besides Amazon and UPS. No national ones, right? I don't. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Uh, Mickey Raiders or Mikey Raiders. Let's try Mikey. Uh, hello, I'm an owner operator running in the Northeast. I want the rates to continue to stay high for another four to five years. Uh, <laughs> when do you think they could ever drop thirty to forty percent lower than they are now? Four to five years is a long time. That's um, a real long time. time uh, in the freight market, um, forty to 50, thirty to forty percent is a lot of drop, though. Um, I don't know. This, this is an extreme speculation. I'm not. I'm not quite willing to go out at all in for that. I'd say anything's possible, and if you uh, need it not to drop thirty to forty percent in the next year, you're probably in okay shape. But if you need for four or five years like no really big reversions, especially because if you're an owner operator, you're not talking about like the overall market. You're not hedging across a lot of different lanes, but individual lanes can have really dramatic swings depending on what's going on. Um, that, that's my take. Yeah. And so if you're, if, if you're profit margin, because one of the problems with owner operators is they don't really look in, they don't really pay themselves. They don't yeah. look at their business as a business. It's just keeping them, you know, enough revenue. Um, and so uh, it, you need to have really high margins right now. Because yeah. you won't see any more margins like this. So if you need to be profitable to have these same rates as they are now, um, then that's going to be tough. You need to make sure that you're making good money now. So when it does drop, and what it, it might not drop, and I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, Ned, but I think it's going to stagnate more until, until it reaches that rather than a big drop. There might be some of that, but I don't, I don't see a 30 to 40 percent. 30 to 40 percent, I don't see. I see maybe 20 percent, but like 20 percent is still like a pretty big correction. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's really going to depend on the way that the trucks, the the new capacity comes in. You know, if we see a huge drop of capacity all at once, then it's going to tend to correct more aggressively. If it is dribs and drabs, then maybe not not quite so much. Uh, do you have time for two more questions, Chris? Sure. I know you're a busy guy. All right. Jack Winstead, hey boys, glad to see you again. What are the best sources of expedite small duty capacity rates? Cargo vans, sprinter vans, box trucks, thanks. Uh, FM, sorry, uh, Benchmark Analytics has a uh, uh, LTL model. I know we're working yeah, on- Yeah, we have LTL, LTL, but not, but that's that's yeah. like traditional LTL. And we don't do much with, uh, again, what's hard with the sprinter vans and those kind of things, they're all local markets. Yeah. It's like short haul. It's so, like for long haul trucking, you can kind of figure it out. You know, there's there's some science to it and there's some economics for the local ones. Every local market, if I know the Newark market, that doesn't tell me anything about New Mexico mm -hmm. uh, or Santa Fe or anything else. And so that's what makes it really hard. LTL is hard also, just like these are, because it's a consolidated mode. So for truckload, it's a truck that's moving for LTL. It's all the different things within the truck. So you got to look at the classification, uh, whether you have the, the uh, density of it, yep. um, the weight. Um, and then also origin destination. But for LTL, as everyone on this call knows, origin destination doesn't really matter that much. Mm -hmm. Not like it does in truckload, but it's the individual characteristics. And what we find is if you have a shipper that has an FAK rate, freight all kinds, it's all out the window anyway. Yeah. So it's really harder, harder to, to do any kind of modeling of consolidated uh, freight that gets put together as opposed to single unit. And then for the local markets, boy, that's tough. We don't have anything specific for that. We'd love to try. Yeah, uh, we do have some stuff in the DAT side, but it's not uh, through our UI. You can contact our uh, data analytic services group. I think it's DAS at DAT.com. Um, somebody probably correct me on that about what the, the actual email is, but it's Alex Perry and his team. They've got um, really good data sources. They can kind of dig deep and get you some of the data products that you need that aren't in like our, our major products because um, of data density and, and other issues. Uh, Eddie Salinas, do you think that the fuel is going to continue to go up? Uh, I don't see a reason for it to go down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to that now, I, I didn't look this morning. I didn't look recently. I, I haven't looked this morning. I think it was four cents maybe over the last couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. I, but, I, I, I bet it will continue to go up. Yeah. As people start driving more, as more mm -hmm. industry comes back online, I, I, I don't see anything to say that it'll go down. All Sorry. Right, yeah, no, good Good luck. See if you can get a uh, good, good fuel surcharge. And again, like what Chris said earlier, get your margins while you can. Like yep. there, there's enough margin that like even as diesel. If you're, just, if you're just making it right now on today's yeah. market, uh, you got to yeah. reduce your, your costs. Yes. 
Um, we have one very final question, and then we'll transition. I know we're running a little over, but Chris is a rare guest, and uh, I'm happy to, to, if you're happy to share your wisdom with the, the broader audience. I can try. <laughs> I, I can't compete with Ken and Dean, man. I feel I you. I feel market. you. Uh, Trey Henley, another problem I've been having in my dedicated freight movements have been more spot than dedicated as late, no doubt due to the port situation. It's put a limit on my options for movement and has affected my revenue stream for our department. Any recommendations on staying ahead of the curve and being more successful in finding replacements? That is rough. I mean, like if you're in the spot market, you're going to be just spread all over the place. You're just chasing, you're, you're going to end up chasing loads all over the place and deadheading a lot. And it's, it's going to be really hurting your your thing. And what we've seen, as, as we talked about in the key points, is that we're seeing a lot more spot movement than contract movement right now. Um, yeah. But we've I, seen over the pandemic, dedicated has grown dramatically more, as opposed to private fleet a little bit, but dedicated more because you have more flexibility from a shipper's perspective with mm -hmm. dedicated. Um, but I don't quite understand your dedicated is turning to spot. Does that mean that your dedicated loads that you're supposed to be have aren't showing up or that you're being pulled to something else? I don't, I don't quite understand. I, I feel like he's being pulled to something else. I feel like, you know, he's used to going like point A to point B, point B to point C, point C to point A. And because of the disruption in the freight market, you go point A to point um, B, and then you got to go to point D to pick up okay. your next load. Yeah, um, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, things that I would say that might be helpful um, lane makers, uh, DAT tool can be helpful. Uh, we've got lane makers and advanced lane makers to try and find who are the big players on a lane, but that's not as much in exactly what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, I, I feel like Ken would have the, the thing in his pocket, but, um, you can, you can save that and ask Ken. Yeah. Ask IQ at DAT.com. I, I'm, I'm sure we've got something. Um, I would, you know, try haul is, uh, the DAT try haul product is really more recommended for, for like owner operators. And we're trying to like essentially break deadhead up into legs where you're actually moving things and, and still getting towards where you need to go. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a rough scene. Yeah. I got nothing to add, Ned. Sorry. <laughs> All right. With that, we are done with our show for the day. Uh, Chris, do you want to plug anything uh, beyond what you've already um, plugged? Or you can plug it sure. again. Sure. No, I'll, I can plug more. I can plug more. On this Thursday, the, what is that, uh, 17th, 18th? Uh, 18th. 18th. Um, um, a Freight Find podcast will come out. Um, and this is with Derek Gittos, who has been at Oracle and was the creator of really their transportation management system. So Derek's been there for over 20 years. He's seen how TMSs have evolved. And so we'll talk about how they're evolving, how they help shippers work with brokers and carriers, and how that relationship is getting much more dynamic. That'll be Thursday's Freightvine podcast. Um, our market update is going to be coming out. Uh, I don't have the exact dates for that. Normally, that's a, a Ken and Dean thing. But do check our market update when it comes out, which is soon, probably. Um, <laughs> TT.com forward slash market update. Okay. Man, we're making a hash at the end of this. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. Thanks no, for having me on. Won't, we won't see you next week. We won't see you next week. Sorry, this is the other thing I have to say. It's Thanksgiving next week. You will not see us next week, but you will see us the subsequent week. And it'll be there the two of you once more. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.